In this session, we're going to be looking at the demon-possessed man in the synagogue as it is found in Mark chapter 1, verse 21 through verse 39. And so what I'm going to do, I'm, just, I'm going to read through this passage so that we'll get the flow of what we really see taking place in this story. So in verse 21, it starts, it says, Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. And there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Do you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Verse 27, it says, Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Verse 32, it says, At evening when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I, that I may preach there also, because this pur for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. So we're looking at the common ministry of Jesus. What did Jesus do in every town that he went into? He just got done saying that. We back up and he says, And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. So he was preaching, casting out demons, and healing the sick. So in every town he went to, preached, healed, cast out demons. And when he sent out his disciples two by two, he gave them the same marching orders. He told his, in every town that he sent his 12 to, they did the same. And then he had 70 other disciples as well, or maybe you have a different translation that says there were 72 other disciples. They did the same thing. They imitated the ministry pattern that Jesus set. And so what I do in my ministry and I hope you do in yours, is you imitate Jesus' pattern that he set in the New Testament. He is our model. He is our example for ministry. So we're looking in this passage now of this demonized man in the synagogue. And so we ask the question, why was a demonized man in the synagogue? Uh, thing was, he had demons and nobody knew about it. It was, a, it was the, uh, uh, to most people, he was normal. This man had not demonstrated this behavior before. Uh, demons, what we find is that they, they hide their presence. They do not want people to know that they are there. They want to keep it secret. Demonized people are not like those in horror movies where you have the head turning in a circle or vomiting green stuff. You know, just, this, just really terrifying scenes. That, that isn't reality. The fourth thing we see about uh, what we learn from this demonized man in the synagogue is that he had been in the synagogue on many occasions. And the thing is, people had, there was no indication that he was demonized. People didn't know it. And so we, we, we do know then that uh, pastors, doctors, psychologists, actors, politicians, all these types, even professionals like this, have had demons and they were delivered from them. So anybody can have demons, just like that man in the synagogue. Nobody knew he had demons. 
So lesson that we learn that demons can and do hide. They can exist inside of a person. Now we had taught in a previous session, uh, Neil Anderson, he, is, uh, he, he taught that it is advisable in his book, Released from Bondage, uh, he says that it's good for Christians to examine. To, just like we go to a physical, uh, you know, a, a, a clinic to have a medical checkup, and we have our, our blood tested, we have our urine tested, and, you know, do a, a physical exam from time to time. It's rec he recommends that Christians go through the process of deliverance to make sure there is no blockage, there's no hindrances, there's no demonic entanglement. It's not saying the person has a demon inside of them, but there could be an oppressiveness. There could be a demons around them that is has hooks in them and they need to be set free from them. It could be that these people have emotional wounds that need healed so that they can reach their full potential and destiny in Christ. So that is the benefit benefit of going through a deliverance process. So we don't want anything hiding in anybody. So what we want to do now is look at some of these phrases that we find in that passage there in Mark chapter 1. And, and in verse 24, we see the phrase, let us alone. That's plural. The demons were speaking and they said, let us alone. So from that, we learn that demons seldom invade by themselves. They come in groups according to their kind. So if you have anger, you're going to have murder, you're going to have rage. That, those are three typical ones that you're going to find in a person like that. I have never experienced a person who has only one demon. Hundreds of people, uh, hundreds of demons have been cast out of people, and uh, I have never experienced one person, an individual, having just one demon. There's always groupings, there's always multiple demons present, and you don't always know how many there are there. The second thing with let us alone is that only one demon spoke as only one personality or consciousness can be present at a time. And also it isn't always the chief demon, the demon that is in control, we call the strong man that speaks. It isn't always that one. The chief demon may often wait in the background. It could be the chief demon speaking, but it could be a lesser demon that is willing to expose the system inside. And so what we, we want to find out who that strong man is, because if you can grab hold and, and determine and, and address and deal with that strong man or, or this uh, chief demon, you can grab hold of the whole kingdom inside of an individual. Uh, the third thing we see about let us alone is that always suspect more than one demon. From the experiences that I have had and with many other people that have uh, been used by the Lord in casting out demons, it's, it's, like I said, it's, it's almost unheard of that a person will only have just one demon. And also, uh, we know that most deliverances require follow-up sessions, as the first one is just taking off the layer, the first layer, while other demons may try to remain hiding trying to avoid detection. We find that occasionally from time to time. We do not have x-ray vision where we can see into a person and determine if there's a demon there or not. But when they go through the process of deliverance, the power of God is so strong through the written word that we're using to address the situation. These demons cannot tolerate it, so it just stirs them up, and they get agitated, and they come to the surface, and we, by the power of God, command them to leave. But there are sometimes there's these really powerful demons, very, very strong ones, that they have, they, they know how to hide deep within an individual. And, uh, and so sometimes uh, after a first session, that person will, at, at a subsequent uh, follow-up meeting with them, they'll report to us that, you know, there's, there's still something else here. There's a blockage and I'm not really able to enter into worship. I can't read the Bible. There's, there's still this something hindering me. And so we'll set up a second a deliverance session and then we'll go deeper. We'll find out some, there's some more things they're hiding. So what we learn is that, uh, uh, that, that multiple emotional wounds provides a place for demons to hide out in. So reading this, it says multiple wounds in a person's souls allows for demons to hide. Inner healing must take place and the individual needs to be very honest and forthright or the deliverance will not be successful. We tell people from the very beginning, you have to be brutally honest with us. And I know that's a very hard thing to do. Uh, we give you a questionnaire 
And on that questionnaire, we ask you to fill out a hundred things uh, that, that pertains to your life. And what it does is it, it opens up everything about you. And that, that can be quite intimidating. And many people do not go through it because of their fear. They're afraid some, that that information about them is going to be uh, released and people are going to know about it. And that's why we safeguard that information with strict confidentiality. Because if there's an inner wound in a person's heart, in their life, the, those demons feed off of that. We're going to be talking about that in a little bit. And until that wound, that emotional wound, somebody did you wrong, if you don't exercise forgiveness towards them, you don't break off emotional soul ties with you have somebody, an ungodly soul tie, that gives a place for a demon's hook to remain inside of you. The second thing is that multiple personalities also present a location for demons to embed themselves or to hide behind. And so we frequently deal with multiple personalities, what psychologists is referred to today as a dissociated identity disorder, where there's different persons. We have had some people up to almost 20 or more different personalities that we deal with. And uh, we, we're able to bring what, what they refer to as fusion or healing of the mind and that personality is dissolved and it dissipates and it's gone and the person comes back to their sound and whole mind again without the multiples anymore. And so we see that happen regularly. It's a very, very common experience. People that you don't know that are around you all the time that have suffered extreme trauma in their life will have um, more than likely, if they've ex ex experienced multiple traumas or very severe trauma, they will have a dissociated identity disorder. They will have another personality in there, uh, kind of like carrying the pain. And we talk about this more in detail in, in, in some advanced training that we do with team leaders in the deliverance ministry. So uh, after a deliverance session, I do not tell a person that they are completely free. I don't get out a certificate and say that you're demon free. We, we have to wait. That's because there, uh, there, are, there may be other kingdoms there inside that person, another strong mix. Sometimes there's multiple strong men that are there or groupings inside that individual and, and they will need to be dealt with and, uh, that we have, and they have managed to avoid detection during the first session. Now, if you are questioning everything I'm saying right now, then you are an individual that is undoubtedly have never had experience casting out demons out of anybody. I'm not criticizing anybody for not having experience doing this, but I know that criticism for this type of ministry comes from people who have never cast out a demons out of a single person. They have no experience, they have no awareness. So like I said, I'm not being critical. I'm not trying to lift myself up in pride uh, over other people, you know, like, like I'm better than other people. But this is a reality. This is an experience that we have. And uh, we don't base uh, this ministry on experiences. We base this ministry on the Word of God and the practices. And we see the power of God at work carrying these things out, setting captives free. We have dozens and dozens and dozens and of, of testimonies that God's power really and truly does work through this process. So our follow-up conversations with the individual that has gone through deliverance will let us know if more work is needed to be done because they will try to hide. Another phrase that we see in verse 24 uh, is, what do we have to do with you? That's what the demon asked Jesus. So you see that these demons were talking to Jesus. These demons spoke through that person, and that is common with us. These demons will speak to us. Jesus was interfering with that demon's plan, with that man there in that synagogue. And they were asking, as it says in the New Living Translation, why are you interfering with us? Why are you bothering us? Uh, they want to remain hidden and out of sight so they can continue to destroy the victim's life as well as those around them. That is their purpose for remaining hidden. They don't want to let people know that they are there because they can continue bring, bringing torment into the person's life as well as bringing torment to all of those that individual is in, is in association with. So, in addition, that was number one. So, number two, uh, in, in conjunction with what 
do we have to do with you? Uh, says, why Jesus wasn't, why was Jesus interfering with their plans? And it says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, that that was his purpose to interfere, interview, interfere with them. For the scripture says, for this purpose, the son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That is Jesus's purpose and plan. And us as ambassadors of Christ, we also are to interfere with Satan's plans, with every demonic power. We're supposed to get right into their plans and mess them up and destroy their works. We are to offensively go after them. We're not supposed to sit back in a defensive posture and pretend they're not there and do nothing about them. We're supposed to take the battle to them. The next uh, phrase we see in verse 24, did you come to destroy us? Again, we see the demon speaking to them. They question Jesus' mission. Of course he came to destroy them and their works, as we just read in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And we, as ambassadors of Jesus, representation, representatives of Jesus on the earth, who are to be the, the body of Christ functioning and flowing out of the church, we are also supposed to destroy these powers of darkness. So, did you come to destroy us before the time? The second thing we see is their tactics are to de de delay their expulsion. They do not want to leave. They want to stay right inside that individual. And so they start asking questions. They start to try to distract you. So these questions, and they'll try to intimidate you. They will provoke you. They will attempt to negotiate. I've, tried, I've had some that will try to negotiate with me, like saying, okay, well, some of us will leave, but, but I, we just want this particular demon to stay behind. And, and I say, absolutely not. There's no ne negotiations possible here. It's unconditional surrender. You're going to release your grip off of this child of God, and you're going to leave them. And so uh, they will tr also try to instill fear in you. They will do all kinds of things to, you know, intimidate you, provoke you. Here's some things that they're going to tell you. Just like they spoke to Jesus, uh, they will tell you, I've been here too long. I won't leave. I've been here since conception. Since their birth, they said they've been here. Uh, this person needs us. This person wants us to stay. You don't have the authority to make me leave. Do you see how intimate? These are phrases that these demons have spoken directly to me and my wife. And when they say, you don't have the authority to make me leave, you don't, if you are not walking close to Jesus, if you are not associated with him very close, these phrases can really rattle your cage. But I know they're just lies. And so uh, through the experience, you just, you just know, I do have authority. Or you say, that they, they might try to intimidate you, say, well, you, you're a sinful person. you got sins in your life, and you can come right back and you can say, my hands are clean, my heart is pure. I know I'm walking in a right standing with God, and I do have authority over you. Christ has given me authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions, and you, demon power, will submit to me. And then, then I've had him say to me, you're getting tired. Because sometimes these battles do get long. I mean, some, some, we've had some of them go a lot, hours, many hours. And I was, I was truly getting tired. And they could recognize I was getting tired. And so they were trying to cause me to give up. They will also tell you that uh, we've had too much fun together with that person, with the, the host of that demon. And so, uh, uh, so, and they also will say, are you sure you should be dealing with us? I've had them ask me that, intimidating me, trying to instill fear in me. Like they're saying, you don't know how powerful of a demon I am. Are you sure you should be dealing with us? They, I've had one of them even say, I'm a general. How dare you mock me? Because what I do, I, I get them up. I work these demons up because some, they want to hide. They want to stay in the background because until you can get them up and come to the surface, come to the front, you, you can't deal with them well. And so that I will intimidate, I will taunt, I will mock them. And so the one come up one time and said, I'm a general, how dare you mock me? And it, and it said it in this accent of, uh, uh, it was Sri Lankan 
accent and sometimes they would even use the Sri Lankan uh, language. The, this person never knew that language and yet this person was speaking. There's a Sri Lankan that confirmed that that was what this person was saying. Uh, and uh, so extremely intimidating if you are not walking close to Jesus and if you do not know the scriptures and this is your sword that you use they will shake you up they will intimidate you they will still fear we've also had demons say that uh, I can't go back to Satan and report defeat they were intimidated they were just terrified they said I can't leave I can't go back uh, I have orders. I've received orders to hang on to this person and to destroy their life. And that's when I tell them, I have just tore up your orders. I have just nullified all the orders you have ever received. You have to come back with those types of things. Or, I can't let them go. They will save too many souls. So that is what they're doing. They're trying to stop individuals from reaching their destiny and reaching their peak potential and fulfilling their purpose and calling in life. Here's another phrase that we see in Mark chapter 1 and verse 24. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. They recognize who Jesus was. And what we see, uh, the demons declared what the Pharisees would not that Jesus was the Messiah. And so these demons knew who Jesus was. And number two, they know who you are. The thing is, they know all about your background. They have followed you the, your entire life. They know the sins that you have committed in the past. They know your weaknesses and failures and things you have done. The demons are, 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 don't just come on the scene momentarily. They're around us all the time observing us. They know who you are. They also know if you are a threat or not. They will know if you are walking in the fullness of, the, the, of Christ or not. They know if you got entanglements of sin in your life. They will know if you have addictions in your life that you're not walking in victory over. And when you don't have full victory, then you have a loss of authority. And they will know that. Uh, they, when, when my wife and I at times would approach a person who is demonized uh, that were, was getting ready to be delivered, they got up and they just ran away from us screaming, running down the road, because uh, those demons in that person knew what was coming, that they were going to be evicted. They will know, number four, if you are a spiritual pushover, and they won't be intimidated by you. They will just sit there and smirk. They will smile. They will mock you. So I know who you are. The Holy One of God, it says in verse 24. They know who you are. Verse 5, why don't demons manifest like they did with Jesus? They aren't being threatened. They aren't being confronted. We have to offensively attack these powers of darkness or these individuals will stay in that condition. It doesn't matter where the demon is, whether it's in, on, or around them, wherever the demon is that is oppressing and tormenting them, we need to get them set free so that God's kingdom can continue to move forward without all this hindrances and opposition. Let me give you an example about threatening and confronting the power of darkness. Because I've written 50, in, the, in the spring of 2020, the year 2020, I've written 53 stories of revivals. And there's been a, s a number of these revivals that were the longest running revivals. The most pronounced were those that had deliverance prominent in the forefront of what was taking place. And one particular one was the 1984 Argentine revival. Carlos Anacondia uh, I'll read this here in this uh, paragraph. It says, The services during the 1984 Argentine revival began with direct confrontation with demons prior to preaching. So they, these demons, they wouldn't interfere with a gospel presentation. So when these big crowds would get together, Carlos Anacondia, the, the evangelist, during the, one of the main evangelists during this uh, revival that started in 1984, he would be up there and he would just begin to speak to any demons that were present, present binding them, 
uh, ex exerting his authority that Christ had given him to over these demonic powers that they would not control these people that are present. They would not be able to hinder. They would not be able to stop the word of God from going forth with power to arrest the souls, to penetrate hearts. He was just exercising his spiritual authority over them. And what was taking place, these demons would begin manifesting through the crowds. And so they, what they had, they had a tent back in the back. And uh, they called it the ICU uh, tent, intensive care tent. And uh, so they would have teams of people that would go out into the crowd wherever these demons uh, were, were manifesting in these individuals. And they would pick up the individual and help them walk back into the intensive, intensive care uh, tent and uh, they would minister them and cast the demons out and so when all of these demons were bound removed from the the big crowds that were there then when Carlos Anaconda would preach a gospel message it had its effect it preached and tens of thousands and thousands of thousands of people were were born again so we see that Demons have to be confronted they have to be threatened and that's one way that we can do it Next one we see is uh, Jesus rebuked him in verse 25. Demons, that's the word him, it's a male. Number one, demons are not always male. There are those with female personalities. Demons are personalities. We have to understand that you're dealing with a personality. So some have identified themselves as Lilith, uh, Jezebel, and we know that there is this incubus and succubus. And you can look up those names. I'm not going to go into detail here. We, we talk about that more in a more advanced training for our, our, our deliverance team leaders. Uh, so you can Google those names if you'd like to learn more. About Jesus rebuking him. There, uh, the, those with no gender, neither male or female, have identified themselves as well. And, and they identify themselves with their function, like a hate anger and murder uh, okay then now let's go to the next one in verse 25 it also says be quiet then we come into this question about speaking to demons some people think you're never supposed to speak to demons this is where some will say you're not supposed to speak to demons if and if that were true how do you tell them to come out how do you evict them how do you take authority over them, bind them, and come to, command, command them to leave? So we talk to demons all the time. At uh, other times, Jesus asked for their names. In Mark chapter 5, he specifically asked for the demon's name. Uh, in Mark 5, verse 11 through 13, we, we see Jesus is seen talking with the demonized man at Gadara when they had uh, they asked to go into the pig. So there was a conversation, a back and forth there. So nowhere is there any verse that says, thou shalt not speak with demons. There is no scriptural uh, commandment not to do that. It is wise, however, not to discuss anything that does not lead to their direct expulsion. So you don't go into theological discussions and do a Bible study with a demon or anything like that. That's just foolish. Uh, also, to explain how much we talk to with demons and Satan, renunciations are direct communications with demons and Satan. Driving demons out of a home, so to, in one instance, is, is require speaking directly to the demons. So we do it all the time. Sometimes we'll stand there and say, Satan, we are standing on the word of God. We will not allow you to do this or we won't allow you to do that. Satan, I command you to take your hand off of my son and off my daughter. You demon powers that are afflicting this person, we command you to get away from them. So we talk to demons all the time. So there is no verse in the Bible that says, Thou shalt not speak to demons. So here's some information that may be helpful in a deliverance session when you do indeed have a person that is demonized the name of the demon or it's or this demon's function a function could be hate murder greed or perversion also you would like to know who is the chief demon sometimes when you can get the name of the demon and who is the chief you you bring the the main power to the forefront and when you can deal with that main power you're able to get all of them underneath their authority and control at the same time Another bit of inf information that may be helpful is finding out how long they've been there and how they got in. 
What was it that allowed them access? What opened the door into their life that, that that demon had authority? Because there has to be an authority figure. There had to have been a, a traumatic event of some sort that uh, uh, allowed that demon to come in. Sometimes they come in uh, through through birth because some pe we've no, we've encountered several that uh, they were dedicated to Satan even before their birth. So they were demonized the moment they were born or even in the womb, just like uh, John the Baptist was filled with the Spirit while he was still in his mother's womb. Another bit of information that might be helping us is what they claim as their legal right to remain. Sometimes we'll get these extremely resistant, rebellious demons that just will not budge. Some people call them bold demons, just uh, really, really belligerent. They will not yield uh, to our commands. And so they have a right to be there. There's something going on there that's giving them a, a, a lodging. And so we, we find out what is the, the legal right that they claimed to lay hold upon this child of God. Because they are squatters, they are trespassers, and they don't belong there. And so... There's some things that we do at that time to extract that information. And when we find that information out, then we're able to kick them out of there and, and they go. Another thing in this, be quiet. The real reason why Jesus told this demon to be quiet is because he wasn't ready for his full purpose and plan to be revealed. This was at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, his three-year ministry, and he didn't want his ministry thwarted and exposed by the demon powers. And this isn't only with the demons that he told to be quiet. Even when he would go around and he would heal people, we see the same thing in, in, this, in here. It says, there were times when Jesus would tell people he healed not to let anyone know who healed them. And that is because he did not want his full purpose revealed. He didn't want people to know right away at the beginning of his ministry that he was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah. He wanted to carry out his ministry and proclaim the kingdom first, up front, without being exposed. That is why he told those demons to be silent, to be quiet. Verse 25, we also see the three, the four words, come out of him. And so when you get to this stage in a, in a deliverance session with a demonized individual, we need to have a predetermined plan when it comes to this point and details on, on how to bring that demon up and cast them out is elaborated on in our seminar. And it's in our notebook that you get during our seminar. So we get the demon, a couple little pointers that, that just to show you a little bit about what we talk about when we, we this plan to cast the demon out. We, we get the demon to declare its doom, cause them to repeat after us. So, so we give them a phrase and we, we command that demon to repeat this phrase after us. And so it, it, it commits them to that phrase. So and then we bind the chief demon to its entire kingdom. Every demon, because like I said earlier, it's, you never will experience a person with just one demon. There will be a, a whole kingdom, a whole grouping underneath the chief demon. So you take the chief demon and you bind by the, the authority and the power of Christ, you bind them all together as one. And then, number four, you expel them all together. And then we see in verse 26, it says, it convulsed and cried out with a loud voice. In Jesus' ministry, we see shrieking, screaming, crying, flailing. In the ministry of Philip the Evangelist in Acts chapter 8, People were shrieking and crying as demons left them. That is a common thing. That, 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 that is a New Testament example of what takes place when a person is set free from demons. So we should not be afraid of that happening now. It is a biblical precedent. We have the authority of the word that we're standing on. This process of deliverance that I use is all built upon the scriptures. There's nothing that we do that is not uh, in, in, in opposition to the Word of God. So Jesus and His disciples regularly experienced manifestations when expelling demons. And some we know of will boast 
about not allowing manifestations in deliverance sessions as they prefer a, a dignified and quiet deliverance. Well, what I have found is that uh, deliverance isn't always gentle. Like I said, uh, people convulse, they fight, they scream, and Jesus did not forbid that. He never forbid that. And I choose to follow Jesus' model of ministry. I want to say that very clear. What I see in the scriptures, I, I follow Jesus' model of ministry. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that we're supposed to go another route when it comes to casting out demons. And so I look at the model that Jesus uh, displayed for us to learn from through the Gospels. I look at the, the, the example of the Apostles. I look at Paul. I look at Philip. And I learn from all of them. And that is the type of ministry that I uh, use uh, in the process when I deal with demonized individuals. So I also want to say that if you do use a quiet method and you're getting results, go ahead and use it. Just get the demons out. I'm not, I don't argue with anybody. And uh, I, I want to see people set free. If, because I know that there's uh, cessationists that do, do not believe that the, uh, that the gifts of the Holy Spirit of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14, and in other places throughout the New Testament, the miraculous, the, the word of wisdom, knowledge, healing, gifts of the, uh, uh, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy, and the gift of faith, and working of miracles, they, they believe that those stopped with the last apostles. I don't find any biblical merit for that belief, but if there's a people that uh, uh, are have a process for of deliverance that is what they call a truth encounter, then I encourage them to just keep doing that. I don't want to impose and argue and debate with them. I'm just saying if you have a process that is getting results, use it. But I'm going to choose to use Jesus' model of ministry and the, and the model that is portrayed in the, the disciples and the followers of Jesus. So we know that uh, the demons convulsed and cried out with a loud voice. And the best way to get a demon out completely is to let it come to a full manifestation. Things, there are some things that you can do to make that happen is, is by saying things like, Telling, talking to that demon and you're saying, get up completely. Because these demons will hide behind the person's personality and hide behind the person's um, uh, consciousness. Uh, so we'll tell the demon, come up now. Come up completely. I want to I address you. I don't want just part of you. I want all of you to come up. Come on. I want to see you at full manifestation. I want to see the nature of who you truly are. And if it's a, a demon of murder, I will say murder, I want to see you. Come on. I want to see murder in your eyes. Because when you get it riled up and you provoke it, that's when you get it up and you, and you can ad address it and you can evict it a lot easier. So the fullest manifestation of that spirit needs to be revealed because that's how you get it all out. Uh, if you allow demons to roar like a church mouse instead of a lion, you're not going to get it all out. There's going to be lingering effects of some other demons that are just going to stay behind. In our deliverance process, we tell people emotions must not be restrained. We're, we're very upfront with that. We tell them if you don't, if you're trying to bury your emotions, if you're trying to hide your emotions, we're never going to bring healing to you. Because people have these emotional wounds in them, deep wounds of their soul. And those wounds cannot be healed if you don't let them rise to the surface. We don't enjoy seeing people crying and weeping and uh, agonizing. And some of the sobbing is so deep. And it's so horrendous and it's so painful. You, it's, it's unimaginable. But yet that is how God works to bring up all that pain, all that hurt, so he can take it away and he can heal you. So we tell people, don't bury your emotions. If you're burying your emotions, you're not going to experience that healing and victory and liberty that you need. So by getting a full manifestation confirms the reality of what is really taking place there. Now, it doesn't have to be a wild scene like what you see in horror movies. Because if a person can sigh a demon out, breathe it out, cry it out, uh, 
that's okay. We're not trying to just make a big scene. Uh, we don't want wild manifestations. That isn't our objective. But what we want to do is get that demon up and so it can be arrested, bound, and cast out. That's the main thing, to get it out. And, do, and demons, they do come out in different ways. Some by exhaling, yawning, vomiting, coughing violently, screaming, violence, shaking. These are biblical things that we, some of them are biblical that we see. And like I have said in some previous sessions, the Bible does not give us an entire understanding of everything surrounding any ministry that we conduct. We have talked about youth ministry. The Bible doesn't give us directions how to conduct youth ministry. There, is even, there isn't even a youth pastor in the Bible, but yet we have that. And so there's also mothers of preschoolers, mops. There is no mops in the New Testament. There is no nursery in the New Testament. There is no directions on worship and singing in the New Testament. What kind of instruments we should use, if any at all. There's no hymnals in the New Testament. Testament any, anywhere. If we're supposed to just use psalms and, 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 or humanly composed songs, you know, we don't, we don't have directions. It's the same way with the ministry of deliverance. We do not have complete package deal on how to carry out that ministry of deliverance. And so we take what we can from the Bible and we put it into practice and allow the Holy Spirit to lead us without violating Scripture. So we see these demons, they will exhale, yawn, vomit, cough violently, scream. There will be violence and shaking. Sometimes they just leave and there is nothing, but they're, they're gone. The thing is, it isn't important to know how it comes out, just that it does come out. Often the way a demon leaves is related to the nature of the demon, how violent that demon was before, and its nature, its function is usually how it leaves. But here's a warning. Don't set a pattern for every deliverance and say that all demons have to leave the same way because every deliverance session is totally different from all the others. Here's another thing we see in our, our text in verse 27. They were all amazed. People need to see the power of Christ today. So we ask this question, do our church services have anything that amazes people? When we come to the church, do we come with anticipation of seeing, seeing something that is going to amaze us? Do we anticipate that? We need a manifestation of God's power that captivates and draws people's attention, like what we see in the Acts of the Apostles. When people see an exorcism, a deliverance taking place, it has a powerful impact. We see in verse 20, 28 in our text, his fame spread. Jesus was meeting people's real needs, not their felt needs. Now, I know that it is common when going through ministerial training that pastors are told to minister to people's felt needs. And what they mean is that look for, people, look for the needs that they think that they have. And Jesus didn't address the needs that the people thought they had, he, dwelt, he dealt with their real needs. And their real needs was deliverance from demons. It was a preaching of the gospel and his physical healing. Their, their need was an encounter with God's power. That is what people had the need of, and that is what brought J Jesus tremendous fame and notoriety. In Psalm 71, verse 17 and 18, is kind of like a life verse for me. And it's about manifesting God's power. It says, Oh God, you have taught me from my youth. And to this day, I declare your wondrous works. Now also, when I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. People need to see the power of God. People need to be captivated. They need to be amazed. They need to be arrested by the reality of the spirit world and the power of God triumphing over the powers of darkness. Just like in the Gospels we see, just like in the Acts of the Apostles, the, the New Testament method of evangelism, we do have a teaching on that in this series. We encourage you to look at that. 
there was always these signs, wonders, and miracles that manifested the tremendous power of God that brought a crowd around, captivated the people, gave the, 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 the evangelist an audience, a captive audience, and when they preached, there was power there, and it pierced hearts, and people were saved. We have to come back to that because there's this young generation. They have never witnessed that. They have never experienced that to that level. So the last sentence there says, or last two sentences, until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. That's what we wanted to do. Declare the power of God to this generation. That is the purpose of this this teaching series, and that is the purpose of our deliverance seminars, to manifest the greatness of God's glory and setting the captives free so they can declare His power wherever these freedom, experiencing, and loving people dwell. Thank you for watching this, uh, this, uh, this, this, this uh, teaching. We encourage you to watch the other ones in preparation for our deliverance seminars.